Hello, I'm Hannah Donner with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Change is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to the third webinar in our new partnership series, Generation Chemical, How Environmental Exposures Are Affecting Reproductive Health and Development. The webinar today is titled, How Chemicals and Air Pollution Are Harming Fertility, Latest Evidence and What We Can Do. There will be a slight change in our speaker lineup today, as there has been an unexpected emergency and Dr. Russ Hauser will not be able to join us. His slides have been posted on our website though at healthandenvironment.org. This webinar series is brought to you in partnership with the University of California, San Francisco's program on reproductive health, the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, the Alliance of Nurses and Healthy Environments, the Endocrine Society, the International Federation of Fertility Societies, and UCSF's Environment Research and Translation for Health Center. After the presentation, our moderator will lead a panel discussion. We will leave time following the panel discussion for a brief Q&A session. You will type in questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. During the Q&A, Linda and Karen will take out will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On our webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Linda Judas. Dr. Judas is a biochemist, gynecologist, and re reproductive endocrinologist whose research focuses on environmental impacts on reproductive health, steroid hormone signaling in human endometrium, endometrial placental inter interactions, endometrium as mucosal tissue, and translation, translational applications of human embryonic and endometrial stem cells. Her clinical interests are endometriosis, infertility, assisted reproduction, and implantation, and ovular, ovularity disorders. She's, a direct, she's director of the Center for Research on Origins and Bi Biological Consequences of Human Infertility and the UCSF Women's Reproductive Health Research Career Development Center. So thank you, Dr. Judas, for joining us. Feel free to pull up your slides now, and we'll start with you giving a brief introduction and welcoming our, the rest of our speakers. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I hope you can see the slides. Let me just center this a little and I'll put it on full screen. So I would like to just give some background information um, before our two speakers uh, give their scholarly reviews. Um, just to remind everyone, we're going to be focusing on the period of um, preconception and a little bit on uh, fertilization and implantation. And also, I think we're all aware that an exposure, whether it's chemical or air pollution, affects the woman. And if she's pregnant, it also affects her fetus and the reproductive cells of the fetus. Um, and sometimes these cells then affect a generation, the next generation, that is not directly exposed. So that's transgenerational, usually epigenetic inheritance. So how do we know whether environmental toxicants and air pollution uh, affect reproductive function? In humans, uh, we mostly have data from observational cohort studies. And we also have in animals, in vitro studies and in vivo studies, uh, really to prove mechanistic underpinnings. And also we have wildlife observations. But most importantly, and quite recently with regard to humans, IVF cohorts, that is couples, individuals, men, women, um, who are undergoing assisted reproductive technologies um, have been the focus of environmental um, impact assessment. And the reason for that is that this approach in vitro fertilization enables scrutiny of the gamete environment in vivo and embryo development in vitro relevant to environmental exposures, both exposures in the lab, IVF lab, 
and the patient's exposures. Now, Dr. Hauser, who was unable to be here today, um, has had a program called the Earth Study, which is Environment and Reproductive Health Study. And I will show a few of the uh, slides relevant to some of his studies and their outcomes. In addition, there is the study of metals and assisted reproductive technologies, smartly called the SMART study, and also the NIH LIFE study. So assisted reproduction um, and environmental toxicants, uh, as, as mentioned, we are now using or analyzing IVF cohorts in response to IVF treatments in the context of environmental exposures and body burdens, looking at blood, follicular fluid, hair, urine, and seminal plasma. And the things that are studied, which are typically evaluated in infertility or fertility evaluations and throughout an IVF cycle, are issues of ovarian reserve, how many follicles are there, in stimulation, how rapidly or slowly do the follicles develop and how many are there and uh, how large do they get, uh, the quality of the eggs, the quality of the sperm, the peak estrogen levels made by the granulosa cells of the ovaries, the endometrial thickness, fertilization rates, embryo dynamics, uh, abnormal genetics as an aneuploidy, implantation rates, and pregnancy outcomes. So there is a huge amount of data with regard to all of these in IVF programs, and then extrapolating this to um, how environmental chemicals and air pollution is sort of a natural next step. So this is a systematic review that was published in 2017, looking at associations of endocrine disruptors and potential reproductive potential and outcomes of women undergoing IVF. And they chose well-designed prospective cohort studies over a 16 year period. And they found that decreased serum estrogen levels in response to stimulation during IVF was associated with higher BPA, decreased serum AMH, which is a measure of ovarian reserve with PCBs. And you can see these other outcomes that are associated with various chemicals, including low antral follicle count for egg quality, low fertilization rates and implantation rates, poor embryo quality, and low clinical pregnancy and live birth rates. Now we do know that environmental uh, smoke, whether it's primary or secondary, can affect health in terms of odds ratios for conception among female smokers undergoing IVF, and that women who smoke have a diminished ovarian reserve. They also have higher levels of FSH, which is a marker of ovarian function and have increased miscarriage rates, low birth rate, and preterm birth. Now from uh, Dr. Hauser's group, they found that high consumption of um, high pesticide fruits and vegetables are associated with lower probability and pregnancy and live birth after uh, assisted reproductive technologies. They, they didn't measure pesticides, but rather they used the um, uh, validated method of high or low pesticide residues, fruits and vegetables. So these are the high ones like strawberries and the fruits that are encapsulated in a strong covering like bananas are on the low side. And what they found was the greater intake of high pesticide residue fruits and vegetables was associated with lower probability of clinical pregnancy rate and live birth with the numbers shown down here. Also, a number of negative IVF out, uh, endpoints have been associated with air pollution. A systematic review showed that certain uh, air pollutants, such as ozone and nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide and particulate matter, as well as diesel exhaust proximity to major roads, um, can affect IVF outcome two to four months before attempting conception and during the IVF cycle. 
Also, here is another study from Dr. Hauser's group um, that close residential proximity to major roadways significantly is associated with lower implantation rates and live birth rates after IVF. And you can see the differences in the percentage of IVF cycles resulting in live birth um, for women living less than 50 meters from a major roadway, 33% compared to 46% for those living greater than 400 meters. And interestingly, um, if you go through an IVF cycle where you start stimulation, you uh, monitor how the ovaries are responding, the eggs are then retrieved, the open pickup, then the embryos, the eggs are inseminated, the embryos are cultured, embryos are transferred, and then we wait to see if a pregnancy will occur. There are several studies that show that, uh, and it depends on the study and it depends on the uh, component in air pollution, that um, having exposures, say, during the embryo culture or during the stimulation or during the embryo transfer may affect outcome. However, the largest study was done by Zhang that showed that these per, that particulate matter, NO2, sulfur dioxide, and carbon monoxide, negatively were associated with biochemical and clinical pregnancy rates. And with longer exposures, there um, were higher odds of um, decreased pregnancy rates. So the IVF cohorts have given us a large insight into mechanisms, in, into vulnerability of um, the gametes and the endometrium and the whole process of pregnancy initiation. So I'm going to conclude now and introduce our next speaker, who is Professor Jody Flaws. And she is, I will stop sharing. And she is Professor of Comparative Biosciences at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, she, her focus uh, of her research is mainly on determining the mechanisms by which environmental chemicals affect development and function uh, in the ovary. And she is widely published and well-funded and is a recipient of numerous awards for her groundbreaking work. The title of her talk today is the effects of a phthalate metabolite mixture on antral follicle growth and sex steroid synthesis in mice. Professor Flaws. Thank you very much, Dr. Judice, for that lovely introduction. Thank you for the attendees. I'm very excited to be here and share some of our work with you. What I want to do today is first give you some background on phthalates and in particular talk to you about this phthalate metabolite mixture that we're using in our in vitro studies to understand mechanisms of endocrine disruption in the mammalian ovary. I also will give a little background on the mammalian ovary and then share with you our data on the effects of the phthalate metabolite mixture on the ovary. In particular, I'm going to talk about the effects of this mixture on antral follicle growth and steroidogenesis, and then I will leave you with some conclusions. So first, just to get everybody on the same page, I want to talk a little bit about what are phthalates. So phthalates are chemicals that are commonly used as plasticizers and additives and a large variety of products. They're heavily used in food and beverage containers. They're components in children's toys. They're major components in building materials such as PVC piping. They're used in things such as baby wipes, they're used as solvents in fragrances, so they're heavily present in perfumes and colognes. They're also used in personal care products such as lotions, shampoos, and conditioners. And they're a major component of IV tubing in medical bags. So we have a widespread exposure to phthalates, but why are we concerned about this exposure? Well, one reason is that virtually in 100% of human fluids and tissues that have been examined, about 100% have phthalates in them. We also know that men, women, and children are all exposed to phthalates, but there tends to be higher exposure in children because of their association with toys. 
and a higher exposure in women because they tend to use more personal care products than men. We're also concerned about phthalates because there are racial disparities in exposure. Several studies have now shown that African-American women tend to have higher levels of exposure to phthalates than white women. We know from large epidemiologic studies, such as the NHANES studies, that on average people have over 13 different phthalates in their system, and that serum levels of these phthalates can reach up to 450 nanograms per mil for one phthalate, or up to 250 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day for one phthalate. Now we're also concerned about phthalates because many epidemiologic studies have shown that they're associated with human health risks. Phthalates have been linked with high blood pressure, increased insulin resistance, pregnancy loss, risk of preterm birth, decreases in sex steroid hormone levels, as well as fertility problems. In addition, several animal studies show that phthalates can affect body weight Depending on the phthalate and the dose and the timing of exposure, these phthalates could either be obesogenic or cause weight loss. They can interfere with development of the reproductive organs. They can disrupt the onset of puberty. They can reduce fertility and induce reproductive diseases. For example, some phthalates can cause conditions similar to polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, most previous studies, particularly in animals, have focused on single phthalates. And these studies are incredibly important because they do assess the toxicity of a single phthalate. However, the reality is, is that humans, in general, are exposed to mixtures of phthalates. So we started thinking about what was known about the effect of phthalate mixtures, particularly on the ovary in rodent species. And we found that there was very limited information available and studies that had been done were not relevant to human exposure, either because they used mixtures that really did not exist in the environment or they used very high doses of the mixture. And even in studies where there were environmentally relevant phthalate mixtures being used, there really was a lack of information on ovarian effects. So one of the things we have been studying in my lab is to look at how phthalate mixtures affect ovarian health. And in particular, I'm going to share data today from our studies looking at a metabolite mixture or a mixture of phthalate metabolites. And I just want to give a few comments on why we're focusing on this mixture. So we know that humans and animals in vivo are exposed to parent phthalates and that these parent phthalates can quickly be metabolized in the body, and that it's the metabolites by and large that are reaching the ovary and the metabolites that are present in ovarian follicular fluid. We also know that metabolites may actually be more toxic than the parent compounds. And there was limited information on really what these metabolites, their direct effects were doing to the ovary. So I want to share with you our data on a particular phthalate metabolite mixture and its effect on the ovary. The phthalate mixture that we made is really based on epidemiologic data from a study being conducted by Dr. Susan Schantz at the University of Illinois that's called the iKids study. And in Dr. Schantz's study, what she did was measure the urinary metabolites of phthalates in urine from pregnant women. And we determined that in these women in her epidemiologic study, there are six major phthalate metabolites present. And these same six phthalate metabolites are actually representative of the exposure in many studies in women in the US. From Dr. Shantz's study, we also determined that the percentage of each of these different metabolites in the urine is shown here in this pie chart. So the urinary metabolites consisted of about 36% of MEP, 20% of MEHP, et cetera. So the mixture that we're using in our study is composed of these six metabolites at roughly these same percentages so that we could mimic what is typical in human exposure. So I just wanna give a little background on why we're so interested in studying this mixture 
on the ovary. So the ovary is critically important for two major functions in reproduction. First, it makes the oocytes or eggs, which need to be ovulated and fertilized to have normal female fertility. Second, the ovary is really important for synthesizing and secreting sex steroid hormones such as estrogen, androgens, and progesterone. And these hormones are required for development of the eggs, implantation of the embryo, regulating menstrual and estrocyclicity, maintaining the entire reproductive tract, and maintaining female fertility. The mammalian ovary is quite complex, and in most mammalian species, they're born with a finite number of primordial follicles, which are immature and not capable of ovulating or making sex steroid hormones. These finite primordial follicles need to grow to primary follicles, then secondary follicles, and then antral follicles. These antral follicles need to be healthy to ovulate and to make sex steroid hormones. So in particular, we were interested in the effects of this metabolite mixture on the antral follicles because this functional unit is so important for ovulating and for making sex steroid hormones. The hypothesis that we tested was that exposure to a mixture of phthalate metabolites decreases growth and alters sex steroid synthesis in antral follicles. So to share with you our experimental design, what we do is isolate antral follicles from mice that are between 32 to 42 days old. These are reproductively cycling active mice. We then can culture each of these individual antral follicles in a 96 well culture plate, either with our vehicle control, which is dimethyl sulfoxide, or different doses of this metabolite mixture. We can then culture these follicles for up to 96 hours. And during culture, we can monitor the growth of the follicles by measuring their diameter using a microscope. We can then at various times in culture snap freeze the follicles so that we can conduct gene expression analysis by quantitative PCR to look at the expression levels of enzymes and factors that are required for steroid synthesis. We can also collect the media from these cultures and subject it to enzyme link immunoabsorbent assays to measure the levels of sex steroid hormones. And in this case, I'm going to share data on pregnenolone, progesterone, androstenedione, testosterone, and estradiol. So I first want to show you our data on follicle growth. To orientate you to the graph, this is the percentage of growth in diameter of each follicle over time in our DMSO treated groups and our different metabolite mixture doses. And if you first focus on the black line, which is our vehicle control, what the data show is that after about 48 hours in culture, the follicles rapidly grow and continue to grow throughout the duration of the culture. Similarly, when we look at our lower doses of this metabolite mixture, after about 48 hours, the follicles rapidly grow. However, when we look at our higher doses of metabolite mixture, our second to highest dose, there's a tremendous inhibition of growth compared to vehicle control. And at our highest dose, growth is completely ablated. So what these data are showing is that exposure to this metabolite mixture is inhibiting growth of antral follicles in vitro. Now follicles, as I said in the beginning, are very important for making sex steroid hormones. And so I wanted to share with you some of our data on the effect of this mixture on steroidogenesis. This is a schematic showing two major cell types in the antral follicle, the fecal cell and the granulosa cell. What happens during normal steroidogenesis is that the fecal cells take in cholesterol into the mitochondria by a factor known as STAR or steroid acute regulatory protein. This cholesterol is then converted by a series of enzymes to precursor hormones, eventually progesterone, and then the androgens, androstenedione and testosterone. These androgens from the fecal cell are transported to the granulosa cell where they're converted by enzymes to the primary estrogens, estrone and estradiol. So what we wanted to determine was, is this mixture affecting expression of some of these key 
factors that are required for making sex steroid hormone? And is the mixture affecting the levels of these precursor and sex steroid hormones? So I'll first show you our gene expression data. On the left, I'm going to have our schematic of the pathway, and I've circled the factor that we're looking at, in this case, STAR. And on the right, I've got our actual data where we're showing expression of STAR after 24 hours of culture or 96 hours of culture and our vehicle control, which is the white bar, and then our different doses of the metabolite mixture. And what these data are showing is that the metabolite mixture is significantly increasing expression of STAR at both 24 hours and 96 hours compared to control. When we looked at some of the downstream enzymes, which I've circled here that are present in the fecal cell, as well as a key rate limiting enzyme in the granulosa cell, those data are shown here. So what I'm showing you is that the metabolite mixture at both 24 and 96 hours significantly reduced expression of CYP11A1. We have reduction in expression of HSB, HSD3 beta in the mixture. We also have reduction of CYP17-alpha1, HSD17 beta1, and aromatase or CYP19A1. All of the, these genes, their expression is reduced by exposure to the mixture compared to control. Now, in addition to looking at the enzymes that are required for making sex steroid hormone, we also looked at two enzymes which are really critically important for metabolizing or breaking down sex steroids. In particular, we looked at cytochrome P451A1 or CYP1A1 and cytochrome P451B1. Both of these factors are well known to break down estradiol into byproducts. And when we look at expression of these, we see with CYP-A1 in particular, that exposure to the metabolite mixture significantly increased expression of this breakdown, um, the enzyme that's required for breaking down estradiol at both 24 and 96 hours. We also looked at CYP1B1, which is another metabolic enzyme. And we do see that the mixture is inhibiting expression of CYP1B1 at both 24 and 96 hours. I would like to point out the scale difference here though. CYP1A1 is being dramatically increased in response to the mixture, where there are more slight decreases in expression of CYP1B1. Now, because we saw these differences in almost all of these enzymes and factors in this pathway, in addition to CYP1A1 and 1B1, which break down sex steroid hormone, we next wanted to look to see whether the mixture was actually affecting the levels of the production of sex steroid hormone. And I'm showing you here in the schematic, I've circled the different locations where they are in the pathway of the precursor and sex steroid hormones we're looking at. On this slide, we're primarily focusing on ones produced by the fecal cell. And I'll point out that each graph has the concentration in nanograms per mil at 24 and 96 hours. Our control is in the white bars and then the different shaded bars indicate different doses of the metabolite mixture. And what we saw was that the mixture significantly increased production of pregnenolone, progesterone, androstenedione, as well as testosterone. And if you remember, I said that the mixture was also increasing expression of STAR at some of these time points. So we think what's happening is that that STAR is being increased, bringing in more cholesterol and driving production of a lot of these downstream hormones. Now, in addition to looking at hormones made in the fecal cell, we looked at hormones produced by the granulosa cell. And I'm primarily focusing here on estradiol. And what we see in this graph is that the metabolite mixture is significantly inhibiting uh, the levels of estradiol after 96 hours compared to control. And if you remember, I showed you that many of these enzymes, especially CYP19A1 or aromatase, the expression is decreased with the mixture compared to control 
it kind of makes sense that this would lead to decreased production of estradiol. To summarize what I've told you is that this metabolite mixture in vitro can affect the follicles by changing expression of the enzymes required to make sex steroid hormones, but also affecting enzymes that are required for breaking down sex steroid hormones. And that this leads to, by and large, lower levels of estradiol production by these follicles. So to conclude, I've told you that exposure to a mixture of phthalate metabolites decreases growth and alters sex steroid synthesis and antral follicles. And I just want to leave you with a few comments on some of our future directions. We're now doing studies where we're trying to determine how mixtures of phthalates affect the ovary in vivo. And we're hoping that together our in vivo and in vitro studies will provide mechanistic information that can be used to develop methods to reduce or eliminate toxicity to phthalates. The reality is that currently it's possible to reduce exposure to phthalates, but not completely eliminate their use. So we feel like by understanding the mechanisms by which phthalates cause toxicity might help us develop policy solutions for reducing or eliminating toxicity due to phthalates that people are routinely exposed to in everyday products. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my wonderful lab for all of their help with these experiments. In particular, I want to acknowledge Dr. Daryl Melling, who's an incredibly talented postdoc in the lab, who did all of the experiments that I'm sharing with you today. And I also would like to thank NIH for the funding, because without their support, we would not be able to do this work. And I would like to thank all of you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. So thank you so much um, for this comprehensive uh, and really important study um, and for the clarity of explanation. Um, so we will have questions at the end of the presentations. And it's a pleasure now for me to introduce uh, Professor Audrey Gaskins, who is assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. She earned her doctoral degree in nutrition and epidemiology from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in 2014. And her research focuses on understanding how environmental, dietary, and lifestyle factors experienced over the whole life course influence reproductive health in men and women. Um, so she today will speak on traffic related air pollution, folic acid and female fertility. Thank you, Linda. Dr. And thank you, for the, thank you for the kind introduction and also thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm really excited to share the research with you and then also as well hear your comments and feedback during the discussion. So first to start off, um, there are many different sources of air pollution. Um, outdoor air pollution originates from both natural and man-made sources. And while natural sources can contribute substantially to local air pollution in arid regions, um, contributions from human activities far outseed natural sources. And so in the US, the leading uh, emissions of air pollution come from stationary fuel combustion, industrial processes, as well as highway vehicles. Air pollution is a ubiquitous, unavoidable exposure. It's not something that just urban residents are exposed to, everyone in the world is exposed to. About 91% of the world's population is estimated to live in places where air quality levels exceed WHO limits, and low and middle, middle, and, low and middle income countries experience the highest burden of this. So every person breathes thousands of gallons of air each day. This makes air the greatest potential source of toxic exposure known to humankind. Some of the best characterized health effects of air pollution exposure are on diseases of the lungs, but the health effects are not limited to the airways. Research now clearly indicates that polluted air contributes to development of the cardiovascular diseases, cancers, diabetes, and mental health disorders, which are the top five leading causes of human death. 
More recently, over the past two decades, research has been increasingly showing that exposure to air pollution is associated with several adverse reproductive and birth outcomes, most notably preterm birth. Globally, in 2010, it was estimated that the number of preterm births associated with PM2.5 exposure, which is a, a component of air pollution, was upwards of 2.7 million, or 18% of the total preterm births globally. And as evidence from this graph, the countries with the largest percentage of this burden um, were located in Southeast Asia, North Africa, and West of Saharan Africa. While re less research has focused on fertility endpoints, there's growing concern that air pollution could be negatively impacting this, this outcome as well. So what do we know about how traffic related air pollution affects fertility or the ability for a couple to produce a live born infant? Well, there have been numerous studies in men showing that Men who have higher exposure to air pollution have lower quality sperm, so lower concentration, lower um, morphology, um, lower motility. They also have perturbed levels of reproductive hormones. In women, we see a similar effect. So among women, we've seen that higher exposure to air pollution is associated with accelerated reproductive aging or lower ovarian reserve measured by anthropological counts. Women with higher exposure to air pollution have also been shown to have higher risk of aberrant menstrual cycles, as well as altered reproductive hormone levels. And all of these are kind of proxies of both male and female reproductive potential. There have also been time to pregnancy studies in the US and Europe showing that couples with higher exposure to traffic related air pollution or who live in, in regions or census tracts with higher exposure to pollution have lower probability of pregnancy or a longer time to pregnancy, um, suggesting that traffic-related air pollution could have a specific influence on fecundability. And then again, a handful of studies from around the world have also shown that women who are higher exposed to air pollution in early pregnancy have an increased risk of miscarriage or the loss of pregnancy prior to about 20 weeks gestation, as well as stillbirth, which is the loss of um, a fetus after 20 weeks. And so all of these, endpoints kind of relate to each other as, as demonstrated in this graphic. Um, and you know, air pollution seems to impact them on, seems to impact fertility on each of these time points. So where has my research focused? Well, as um, Linda nicely highlighted, um, assisted reproductive technologies can, can be a really unique window into how environmental exposures can affect fertility in humans. And I've really capitalized on this, this um, the cohort of couples undergoing these technologies to really examine the association between air pollution and fertility further. Again, as Linda indicated, one of the beauties of these cohorts is much of uh, reproduction is externalized. So we really get a window into reproduction that we would never get into couples conceiving spontaneously. But the other nice thing when it comes to air pollution is that all of the processes are, are, are nicely timed by clinicians. So we know exactly when fertilization occurs. We know exactly when, you know, ovulation or egg retrieval occurs. Um, and so it makes us, it gives us the ability to actually examine very acute time periods as well. So the study I've used to examine air pollution and fertility comes from the EARTH study. Um, and this is a cohort that was led by Russ Hauser. It started in 2004 and just ended in 2019. And it enrolled couples presenting at the Massachusetts General Hospital Fertility Center in Boston. These couples filled out extensive lifestyle, medical, reproductive history questionnaires. They also provided their residential address at enrollment, and we geocoded these and linked them to fine scale spatiotemporal models of air pollution. The couples also filled out a food frequency questionnaire upon enrollment into the study to assess long term dietary habits. We then followed the couples through all of their infertility treatment cycles. Here, I'll just be presenting on their assisted reproductive technologies or IVF slash ICSI cycles. Um, and all of this was accomplished through our wonderful research nurses who abstracted the information from their medical records. So first, this is what the ge geographical distribution of women enrolled in our study looked like. Um, as expected, the majority resided in and around Boston, 50% lived within the greater Boston area, and about 80% lived within a 15 mile radius. So as you can see from the black dots up here, we had women in Southern New Hampshire, Southern Maine, Rhode Island, as well as the Cape of Massachusetts. 
So one of our first findings that was highlighted in the introduction um, was that among women um, undergoing IVF, those who lived closest to major roadways defined by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation had lower probability of live birth. And so you can see here, um, women who lived within 50 meters had an adjusted probability of live birth of 33% compared to 46% among women who lived more than 400 meters away. And so this resulted in an absolute difference of a 13%, which is a pretty large difference. And this was adjusting for measures of socioeconomic status, such as education, census tract, median income, and other lifestyle variables. Next, we wanted to follow up this investigation by looking at specific air pollutants. And, and we were really interested in pollutants that were um, primary markers of traffic, because again, we saw that residing closer to traffic seemed to be um, negatively impact IVF outcomes. And this is just a picture of what one woman in our study's exposure looked like. So you can see here, we started deriving daily exposure to air pollution starting three months prior to her IVF cycle. And as you can see, the daily levels will vary some. Here's when she started her cycle. She had her eggs retrieved, embryo transfer, and then we followed her through until failure or live birth. And we decided to look at time varying exposure throughout the cycle, as well as look at specific acute windows of exposure to see um, if this would give us any insight into critical windows um, and how that might impact live birth. So some of our main results were that higher exposure to nitrogen dioxide, which is a specific marker of traffic-related air pollution, was associated with higher odds of failing at ART, and that can be seen here. So an interquartile range increase in NO2 exposure was associated with a 7% higher odds of failing at ART prior to live birth. When we looked at odds of failure during specific time points shown here, you can see the effect was strongest earlier in the cycle when stimulation during controlled ovarian stimulation and tended to attenuate as the cycle went on, suggesting that the effects of air pollution seem to be on follicular or ovarian response to stimulation. We saw similar results for black carbon, which again is another marker of traffic-related air pollution, suggesting that higher exposure throughout the cycle but really specifically during these early time windows were associated with this heightened odds of failing at IVF. Next, we started thinking about potential biological pathways through which air pollution could be impacting abnormal follicular or embryo development and placentation. And, and a couple ones we came up with were heightened oxidative stress, endocrine disruption, DNA methylation, altered immune response, as well as inflammation. Given my background in nutritional epi, I immediately thought, well, you know, maternal diet actually impacts a lot of these same pathways as well. And so because air pollution is an exposure that we have little day-to-day -day control over, you know, diet is something we can actually change. And perhaps we could, you know, hypothesize and investigate different dietary components that might ameliorate some of these negative consequences. So one of the first nutrients we looked at was folate or folic acid. And I love folate because it's involved in so many different reactions throughout the body and it, it plays a very key role in reproduction. And that's largely due to its um, involvement in the DNA cycle, as well as methylation. We've previously shown in the Earth cohort that among women undergoing ART, those who consumed higher amounts of supplemental folate or folic acid had significantly higher adjusted odds of live birth. And we saw that intake even well above the recommended daily amount, which is 400 for pregnant women, we still saw benefits up until about 1,000 or 1,200 micrograms per day. Other researchers have also shown that, air, that B vitamins might attenuate some of the health effects of air pollution. And so this top study is from an intervention study, which said that B vitamins could attenuate the DNA hypomethylating effects of air pollution exposure. There's also been two studies from the reproductive epidemiology literature showing that um, intake of maternal folic acid might attenuate the effects of air pollution on risk of autism spectrum disorder, as well as congenital heart defects. When we looked at the association in our study, we can see here that we saw the most significant effect with nitrogen dioxide. And so among women with higher intake of folic acid, so it consumed above 800 micrograms per day, there was really no association between heightened or increased exposure to NO2 and odds of life birth. But among women with lower intake, higher exposure to air pollution, NO2 was associated with decreased odds of life birth. 
And this wasn't sensitive to the cutoff of 800 micrograms. We saw this across the continuum of intake. So here, this kind of nicely shows that among women with the lowest intake of supplemental folate, so let's say 200 micrograms per day, we saw a pretty steep negative association, such that higher exposure to NO2 was associated with lower probability of live birth. As women increased their intake, this negative association kind of leveled out or attenuated, suggesting no association. When we looked at different endpoints, as you can see, we really saw the nicest separation or difference between these two groups among live birth. Um, and this was because we saw a very strong effect of nitrogen dioxide on increased risk of pregnancy loss among women with lower intake of folic acid, suggesting that um, this might be one sensitive endpoint through which both of these, um, this nutrient as well as this environmental exposure might be acting on. So some brief conclusions, um, hopefully by this point I've convinced you that there's evidence that conti is continuing to grow supporting a link between ambient air pollution and impaired fertility. My research as well as others really suggests that traffic related combustion byproducts such as NO2 and black carbon might be the primary driver of these associations. We've also seen that short term exposures during critical windows may be particularly important um, and ART studies have really helped us advance this knowledge. Um, individual choices, such as dietary habits, might offer some protection against the negative reproductive consequences of air pollution, um, and further research is really needed on this as well. But there's many lingering questions and areas for future research, and I'll, I'll touch on some of those um, to kind of conclude. So first, we know there's huge racial disparities in exposure to traffic-related air pollution, and I wasn't really able to address this in, in any of my research just due to the lack of, of racial uh, minorities being enrolled in our studies. So if you look at this map of the United States, it's mostly red, which indicates that in virtually all U.S. counties, non-whites have a significantly higher exposure to nitrogen dioxide compared to their white counterparts. We also know that there's huge disparities in infertility rates, access to infertility treatments, and success of ART by race ethnicity, with non-Hispanic Black women being at particular disadvantage. So we really need more research to understand what is driving these disparities and whether heightened exposure to environmental pollutants may be driving some of this. And then finally, I'll end on kind of taking a step back and focusing on the bigger picture. So over the past century, the total fertility rate of all countries has declined precipitously. Such that no Western countries have birth rates between 1.4 and 1.9 children per women, which is below replacement levels. This has important far reaching implications for future population sizes. While birth rates are decreasing in most age groups, there's one notable exception birth rates to women 35 and older. And this trend is not unique to the United States. On many accounts, this can be viewed as a good thing. Older mothers tend to be more educated and more affluent, and thus can provide a more stable home environment. However, 35 is also the age at which ovarian reserve starts to markedly decline and the rates of infertility start to strikingly increase. Because these trends don't seem to be changing anytime soon, understanding the environmental drivers of female infertility is becoming increasingly important. And any factors such as air pollution that could be accelerating reprodu reproductive or ovarian aging could have important implications on the size and future growth of the US population. So what can we do? Well, I mentioned some dietary modifications that on an individual level might offset some of the negative reproductive consequences, but by far our best way to reduce ambient air pollution levels is through long-term national policies. In the US, the combined emissions of six common pollutants has dropped by 74% since 1970 due to the Clean Air Act and technological advances. However, we can still do better. We still know that there's health effects at these low levels. To keep on these downward trends, we must elect government officials who support clean energy and who support sound environmental policies that will protect our planet and the health of our um, subjects. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. I would also like to acknowledge my funding from the NIEHS um, 1999 R00 award, which allowed me to embark on this uh, endeavor looking at air pollution and fertility. So thank you so much um, for that wonderful talk and very informative. Um, so I would like to hand this over to Karen Wang um, from Che uh, to begin the dialogue for questions and answers. Karen? 
Oh, great. Um, sure. Uh, you know, I think um, a couple of people have asked um, if uh, they, if you guys could speak about how your research um, correlates to exposures in uh, in in real life, um, and uh, yeah, could you comment on that? Because sometimes there's you know there's especially Linda, if you could start off talking about how uh, IVF cohorts, you know, the research that we know from there correlates with um, what happens um, in people who are not um, seeking fertility care. Sure. Um, so there are pretty good epidemiologic data from uh, China, a recent study demonstrating that the fertility rates um, are markedly decreased in areas of high pollution. So it's, um, these are data that are population-based data, uh, so not stratified by fertility or infertility. However, the data are quite striking. Um, there's, I don't think there's much reason to believe that um, women or men who are undergoing fertility therapy are more susceptible to uh, either air pollution or endocrine disruptors. Um, but, and also when the exposures have occurred uh, is, as we know, important and not always discernible. So when the exposures occurred might contribute to the infertility, uh, but being particularly susceptible or different uh, in terms of susceptibility to the um, environmental contaminants, um, I think is not specific to the IVF population. Jody, could you comment, uh, Dr. Flaws, could you comment a little bit about um, how the exposures in the study you presented um, are, are they, you know, similar to exposures that uh, women have um, in normal life? You're on. You're on mute. I think. Sorry, that's a that's a great question. So, as far as the types of phthalates and the percentages that were in our mixture, I think those are very relevant to what women are exposed to. Um, the difficulty comes when you're looking at an in vitro mechanistic study and trying to calculate whether the actual doses we're giving of the mixture are the same doses that people would be exposed to. And part of the problem is that we have relatively little information on exactly how much of each phthalate in our mixture gets to the ovary and then how long it sits there for. And so I am always hesitant to take our in vitro data and specifically say, well, these doses mimic what gets to the ovary in a human because we don't have enough information to know that. What I will say is that the phthalates we're using, the percentage that we're using in vitro, and the fact that we're using a wide range of doses, I think we're going to capture some of those doses that would actually get to the ovary, but I can't say that for sure for every single dose. Okay, great. Um, you know, Dr. Flaws, you talked about phthalates and um, Dr. Gaskins, you talked about air pollution, but in real life, um, many women are probably exposed to both concurrently. Could you guys talk a little bit more about um, if you know uh, of any research looking at these types of mixtures and infertility and um, just just comment more on, on, on the fact that um, you know, most women are exposed to a mixture of endocrine disruptors and pollutants. Sure, so I can, you know, in the EARTH study, which I presented on, um, we measured both phthalates and as well as air pollution. And, um, you know, one of the things is, yes, we are exposed to both of them 100%, um, but because phthalates are not as much determined by where you live, they aren't that highly correlated with your exposure to air pollution. And so, and in that sense, while yes, in the Earth say we saw that both exposure to phthalates as well as exposure to traffic related air pollution was, was bad in terms of um, having a lower probability of success. Um, they weren't, the exposure to both were not related to each other, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, we had some specific questions here. Um, let's see. Um, actually, somebody asked about exposures um, for and how it affects male fertility. Um, could any could either of you guys comment on that? I can comment a little bit on um, phthalates and mouse studies and, and fertility. So one of my collaborators, Dr. Jay Cope, has looked at prenatal exposure to phthalates and how it affects fertility in the male offspring. And he does see dramatic um, decreases in sperm counts and abnormal sperm morphology, as well as decreases in testosterone levels. And I know there have been other studies, animal studies, where people are seeing that phthalate exposure, whether it be prenatal or postnatal exposure, does affect sperm and fertility in them. Yeah, so as I mentioned in my slides, there have been several studies showing that air pollution negatively impacts semen quality. Um, the problem is that we've never really found a semen quality parameter that, that, that is that predictive of couple fertility. Um, and so it's, ch and it's challenging to do studies on paternal or um, yeah, paternal exposure to air pollution and couple related fertility endpoints independent of the female exposure because we estimate exposure based on where the couple lives and the vast majority of couples are residing at the same address. And so they would be assigned the same exposure. Um, even if you were to incorporate their occupational um, resident, you know, where they're where they work, um, it still would be very highly correlated. Um, I think there are some interesting ways that we can try and address this because there has been, I think, one study um, from India showing that, that um, women who are married to traffic policemen had had an increased rate of spontaneous abortions relative to the, the regular population. And so there's some interesting data suggesting that there might be a specific adverse impact in men. We just, um, it's, it's challenging to look at in, in human studies. Great. We have a lot of um, healthcare providers mm -hmm. in the audience today. Could both of you, um, and Linda too, could all three of you guys address, you know, what can healthcare providers do to communicate this science to patients and um, how should it affect patient care? So I guess I can start. Um, I think it's important to follow the precautionary principle. Um, mainly, and, and that is with regard to trying to minimize exposures as much as possible, such as air pollution, if, if one can do that. I saw in the chat or a question a q and a box, uh, someone asked about whether those pursuing fertility um, should have an air filter in the house. So there are no data um, to address that. Um, however, at times of high pollution and using the local air quality index, for instance, as a guide, um, simple things to minimize exposures, stay indoors. Um, if you if, use an air filter in the house, if you can, um, but to do that proactively to filter out everything, we just don't have any data about. So I'd like to hear what some of the others would comment on. I guess my comment as far as phthalates would be just to reduce as much as possible exposure. Um, often you can reduce your phthalate exposure quite a bit by limiting the use of colognes and perfumes and other types of personal care products that are pretty high in phthalates. It's pretty hard to eliminate building materials that, that have phthalates in them, but maybe um, one thing I will say is that older buildings tend to leach more phthalates than some of the newer buildings, and so being cognizant of that fact. And then the other thing about phthalates is there have been a few studies now showing that levels can be quite high in some fast foods. So paying attention to how you might be exposed to phthalates through the diet and really limiting the amount of fast food um, consumption. 
Yeah, I agree with what Linda said about air pollution. Um, there haven't been any studies looking at the use of air filtration and, and that impact, but I don't think it's going to do any harm. Um, we just don't know if it, if, if it will have a substantial impact, um, although that would be an interesting area of future research. Um, you know, like I mentioned, a lot of my research has focused on dietary modifications that might help ameliorate some of the negative consequences. And so, again, that's that's um, a nice idea that, you know, if you if you have very little control of your exposure, then perhaps there's other things you can modify to help up offset that. OK, great. Um, I'd like to make just a couple of other comments, if sure. I may. One is in the uh, chat box, a uh, comment from Jean Schumacher about EWG having um, being a place where one can go to find the cosmetic database and the clean product, cleaning product database to help um, guide decision making with regard to personal care products and uh, cleaning products for the home. Um, also, it's important, I think, to be reassuring that um, and, and not to perhaps obsess too much about how a, a particular chemical or exposure can affect fertility because we don't really know, as Jody has really eloquently explained, we are living in a mixture, a soup of chemicals. Uh, that said, the precautionary principle, again, in terms of minimizing exposures as much as one can, I think would be the most reassuring. And simple things, if one works, if one has exposures to organic solvents, for instance, which are associated with, for instance, irregular periods in women, um, to, uh, especially occupationally, to be sure that one has the protective um, environment for and, and healthy environment uh, in the workplace. Um, so there are ways to look around and see what could be um, damaging uh, and to try to mitigate those as much as possible. Great. Um, we had a question for you, Dr. Flaws. Um, there's some evidence that phthalates work in additive um, manners to impact male reproductive development from fetal exposure. Is there any evidence from your studies of whether the dose additive model holds true for female reproductive effects? Yeah, that's a great question and actually something we're really starting to think about and want to work on a lot next. Um, in general, what we've done so far is only compare like a phthalate mixture to a single phthalate. Um, and sometimes the mixture gives very different effects than the single phthalate. Sometimes the mixture gives more profound effects on steroid levels or gene expression than the single phthalate, but sometimes it's the opposite way. So it's very complex and we don't really understand it. So what we're trying to do now or thinking about doing is for each phthalate in the mixture, identifying its toxicity separately and then kind of putting them together to see whether they're additive or not. So I suspect, yes, they will be, but I don't have a lot of data to say that. Okay, great. Um, somebody asked, and I, I think this is interesting. Um, could you, uh, Dr. Gaskins, could you comment about the reduction in US premature births since the pandemic this year? Um, it seems from your talk that this re reduction may be linked to a reduction in air pollution. Would you hypothesize that there might be an in increased live birth rate in IVF cycles since COVID due to reduction in air pollution? So um, my read of the literature is, is that that association is still a little bit um, unanswered. Um, certain, certain hospitals have seen decreases in preterm birth rates, but, but it hasn't been universal. Um, you know, it could have to do with decreases in air pollution exposure, but it's going to be so hard to tease that out from everything else that's changed in our lives over the past nine, 10 months. Um, so possibly, but, you know, there have been a lot of changes. Yeah. Less movement, less travel. Yeah, so many things. 
Yeah, um, in, in some ways there's been less stress because maybe you don't have to go into work and you've been able to you know, rest more, but there's also been an increase in a lot of other stressors like unemployment or um, you know, fear of your loved one getting COVID. So it, there's a lot of things that are in our playing. Yeah, definitely. Um, could the speakers, uh, someone asked, could you guys comment on um, policy changes that might um, be protective for, uh, for, for women and for families. Um, a couple of um, audience members commented about how diet and lifestyle changes are very expensive um, to avoid these exposures. Sure, so for me, I mean, the biggest way to reduce ambient um, exposure to air pollution is through national policies and putting limits on emissions and just making sure that we're continuing on that downward trend that we've been on since the 1970s. We also have a tremendous amount of work to do on racial equality when it comes to exposure to air pollutants, as I showed in that graph. Um, we know that certain communities have a much higher exposure and there's a lot that we could do to help ameliorate that. Um, when it comes to lifestyle changes, folic acid is really cheap. That's actually not something that's that challenging to, to buy or to implement. Um, and so, you know, th that's one of the nice things about that a nutrient such as that um, is that it's accessible and most, most women can afford it. So I'd, I'd like to remind everyone of uh, Tracy Woodruff's uh, slide that she has shown at many meetings that says you, you can shop your way out only a certain amount of um, being able to reduce one's exposures. Uh, and the rest of it really is in changing health policy. So it's really important that um, Patients are aware of the issues and the obstacles, uh, both from a personal care perspective, but also what they can do as advocates, and also for healthcare professionals. Um, having edu edu educating first healthcare professionals, some are still, um, I would say, there's an uneven appreciation for the quality of the evidence uh, pointing to harm. For, from many of the environmental chemicals, persistent as well as non-persistent, and air pollution on fertility. Um, and so educating healthcare professionals is important for patient um, uh, advice, but also for hopefully inspiring healthcare professionals to join others who are advocating, uh, either at the state level or at the national level or at the global level. Great, thanks so much. Um, let's see. Uh, we had an audience member ask um, Dr. Flaws if you've considered differences between systemic phthalate exposure through food, dust, et cetera, versus direct vaginal phthalate application from um, feminine care products. Ah, that's that's a, a great question. So we thought about it a little, but we haven't really designed any experiments to get at that issue. Most of our in vivo experiments we've done have all been oral dosing um, by gently pipetting the phthalate into the mouth. Um, we're, the, we're starting now to see if feeding phthalates through the diet, through the chow, is going to cause different or the same effect, but we haven't thought about doing anything with vaginal application. But that's a really, really interesting idea that somebody should do for sure. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, um, I think that we've addressed this, but there, there are several more questions about how to reduce exposures to phthalates. Um, uh, could, could. Um, Dr. Flaws, or uh, could you comment about, you know, what are some of your top uh, top ways that people can um, can reduce phthalates exposure? 
So like I said before, I really think that the things we can control are our diet and use of personal care products. And another place is house dust. So phthalate levels can be quite high in house dust. So keeping dust free as much as possible will hopefully reduce exposure to phthalates. But I think most of it that we can control is gonna come from use of personal care products and other products um, such as fast food that have some, some of them have higher levels of phthalates that we can reduce our consumption of those things. Yeah, so one thing that um, we have done some work on educational work is that Looking for fragrance-free products can be a, a way to reduce phthalates, whether or not that's personal care products, cleaning products, laundry detergents, um, household dust, uh, and um, just eating less processed and packaged food. Um, eating real whole foods can be a way to reduce phthalates. Um, yeah, so great. Thank you so much. Um, I think that... Uh, we answered a lot of the questions that we have. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, Linda, do you have any concluding remarks? So I'd, I'd like to just um, make a couple of comments regarding um, exposures and that have been measured in humans. Um, we talked about, and Audrey did a fantastic job in, in explaining about the IVF cohorts and the data that were obtained through the uh, Earth study. Um, the, I think this uh, webinar really underscores how important the epidemiologic data are that then give rise to the ability for the scientific bench experiments like Jody Flaws is doing um, to translate um, basically observational data in humans to mechanistic data underlying um, some of the abnormalities one may see. So this has really been an excellent um, synthesis, if you will. And the other is a comment with regard to um, Audrey's finding on folic acid and probably has to do with epigenetic mechanisms. Uh, it's been shown certainly in, in rats, um, but I think it's important that we try to maximize the ability to minimize these harms, but also not to open the door for regulators to say, well, you can have this, so it doesn't matter if you're being exposed because you can mitigate it with X, Y, or Z. So. It's a fine balance, again, between um, maximizing health and also uh, minimizing harm. So I'm, I was just totally delighted with this wonderful um, webinar today that has really given the whole range of um, from epidemiology to basic science to policy to practicalities for women and men and physicians and other healthcare providers to maximize fertility and well being. So, thank you. Great. Thank you so much to everyone, to all of our speakers. Um, Dr. Judas, thank you for moderating today and for jumping in for Dr. Hauser, who we wish well. Um, and uh, so, we want to thank everybody. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Shay's website soon, and tomorrow we'll receive, you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next generation chemical webinar on preconception exposures will take place January 28th and will feature Drs. Janet Hall, Carmen Masserlian, Kim Harley, and Yu Zhang. Details will be posted shortly on our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. 
With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Linda Judas, Jody Flaws, and Audrey Gaskins for taking time to present today. And to Linda and Karen, thank you for moderating. Thank you so much for joining us. We're wishing everybody much health and wellness. Have a great day.